I appreciate it. Uh, thanks everyone too for being here today. I know that uh, we all have so many things going on and I really hope that um, I can help alleviate some pressure from you guys operationally today and answer some specific questions that you've got going on. Uh, we've got a nice intimate group today, so I'm hoping that um, we can make this um, obviously presentation. I've got some things prepared for you guys in terms of teaching, but also um, personal in terms of what you guys are going through and how I can help you guys through that. So um, as always, uh, I'll be kind of interacting with you guys throughout the uh, throughout the presentation and throughout the next hour. Um, my hope is, is that I can, again, alleviate some pain from you guys immediately, some things that you guys are feeling operationally, and then, um, you know, we can kind of collaborate uh, via the chat or even in kind of like a workshop style session. So um, let me know if you guys have questions throughout, and I'm really excited to get started. So I'm going to share my screen here. Y'all see that? Looks good. All right, awesome. So this presentation is called Operation Simplified, Minimal Structure, Maximum Results. Um, basically what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go over just a couple of things. We're gonna go over, also brought to you by me, Operations Agency. And today what we're gonna go over is first and foremost, why ops matter for growth. Um, so many folks who start businesses, they, I feel, um, you know, get really excited about the result that they provide and not so excited about running an actual business. And so today we're gonna talk about why situating your business business kind of around your ops department um, really does help um, with so many different things in the business. We're going to talk about five key ingredients for any successful ops department, the key tools that you'll need to implement, how to affect change in your business. Then I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions and some workshop time so that we can answer some individualized things together. So who am I? Uh, my name's Allison. I, uh, there's my family there in the middle. Um, we actually just welcomed a brand new little one uh, back in August. And so my son, he's grown quite a bit. <laughs> His name is Frank. And uh, we just love kind of staring at him, honestly, all day. It's probably never going to get old. So me more professionally, I'm the founder of Operations Agency. I've created uh, dozens of playbooks, which is uh, kind of the central location, at least what we call um, all of your standard operating procedures for your business. Um, I've managed seven and eight figure ops departments. And I've also trained and managed uh, very highly effective teams, um, and especially lean teams. I know that some of y'all have probably needed to pivot here, um, you know, in the pandemic. And so we definitely talk about operationalizing around potentially even cutting your team, um, you know, in half. So these are just a kind of messy slide of all the teams I've worked with just here in the past couple of months. Um, we definitely have our hand in a lot of different types of businesses. So I'm hopeful that this overview will help you guys. Um, my goal is to help you understand what components of an ops department you're, you might be missing right now and identify some key steps to alleviate, um, you know, growing and pivoting pain. And I know that sometimes we wake up and we think this, right? So wake up coffee and then we just got to do the rest and things seem somewhat ambiguous and we might feel overwhelmed. But my goal is to help make things a little bit more predictable for you here um, so that you can kind of look into the future with confidence and know, um, you know, that things are going to be, you know, taken care of. And so that's one of the biggest, I think, uh, you know, silent things that ops provide for a business. So if you are hiring a manager, managing a team currently, uh, getting repeat questions all the time, um, the project manager or main point of contact for clients, the bottleneck in your business, going out of scope with projects, lacking quality and consistency, not very profitable. Those are some of the symptoms that, you know, really signal to us that we might need to take a look at some of your operational elements. And what we'll do today is we can help laser in your ops department, fill it with the most effective tools and team, um, get your projects back in scope and basically lay a foundation on which to scale. So I'm excited. So tell me really quick, I'm going to open the chat up, who has um, a playbook with standard operating procedures inside of it? And what I mean by a playbook is a central location for all of the standard operating procedures in your business. And that's okay if you don't have one. I'd like to know also if you don't have this. So playbooks. Okay, Tim, that's awesome. You do have one. Tammy says no. Okay, that's all right. No to Steve. Okay. Believe it or not, guys, it's actually way more common than you think for even very established businesses to have um, no playbook. And Angela, thank you for sharing. Solopreneur looking to add a VA and grow a team. This is going to be especially useful for you. And Star, thank you. Welcome. For, thank you for answering. Um, you know, so the biggest thing that I can say is, again, you guys are not alone. This is actually very common uh, that to not have kind of a central location for everything. The second thing I wanted to ask you guys is who has potentially a team member whose primary role is ops? 
Angela, I know you said you're looking to hire a team. So I guess this question doesn't uh, apply to you or maybe you're just the main ops person. <laughs> That's great, Amy and Darlene. Thank you. Star says yes, herself is, is dedicated to ops. Okay. Anyone else have team members who are dedicated to ops or primary role is ops, maybe project management? Okay, but without much definition about what that means, Steve, I appreciate the honesty here. And again, very, very common. There are um, op ops is technically in a lot of businesses that I've personally worked with, one of the last hires um, that folks make, right? They, they start with kind of the, you know, money makers, right? The people who are doing the fulfillment or doing the sales or doing the marketing. And we really kind of leave this other, um, how do I put it, almost unsexy, you know, section of our business really, really untended. And then it's a shame kind of how it kind of wreaks a couple of issues onto our business. So part one I'm going to talk about is, you know, why ops, right? Why do we need uh, this, this in our business and what kind of improvements does it actually tangibly make for us? So for low input, high caliber results, the, the value of an ops department include just a couple of things I wanted to highlight here. So less turnover with employees, um, the cost to train an employee is, is far lower if we've got something standardized, which is, I think, part of an ops department, um, a faster training path for new hires. So meaning they're getting results in the business a lot faster. We've got better bottom line profit. That's just probably the most exciting thing that all of us are probably here wanting. Um, uh, more sale value, meaning if someone approaches you to acquire the business or you know, you're know you basically partnering with somebody or you're looking for venture capital, um, having an ops department and having something like this really structured does provide provide more actual tangible value in the market. Uh, you look at higher customer retention uh, because customers are knowing what to expect. Quality and consistency are there. And then we've got just an overall more predictable business. Like I mentioned before, that kind of, you know, a feast and famine model of I've got a whole lot of clients and now I got to fulfill on them. I got a whole lot of clients and now I got to fulfill on them. It kind of evens itself out just a little bit more. So the goal with an ops department is to plant now, harvest later, right? We want to make sure that we set this up to be something that we roll with into the future and that we can basically leverage to scale. So next couple of parts, I want to get kind of into the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about today. I want to talk about the five ingredients that a successful ops department has and the tools uh, that y'all can implement uh, specifically. And I've got some tools for you guys here in the workshop session that we can start to work through in terms of um, actual tangible things. So who already has an ops department? I think that um, I kind of know already how that's going to go, but tell me in the chat. Um, okay. So Tim has some Thing broken down across finance, HR, billing, collections, and general admin. That's actually wonderful. Um, the three main components I would mention um, that kind of fall under the ops umbrella typically are ops, HR, or sorry, business admin, HR, and finance. So those are pretty much the three things. Um, so does someone have kind of an ops department, you know, a rough one, at least right now? Just let me know in the chat. Nope, single person business. Okay. Okay. The EC has an ops department. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So let's talk through this really quick. So actually one more question before we get in, what do you guys primarily look at as an indicator of success? Like for your business, do you guys look at one number or one indicator? How many clients you have? How many sales do you have? Anyone, anyone looking at one thing consistently? Sales, okay. Different for each department. Financial projections, KPIs, sales and customer satisfaction. Okay, those are all good. Those are all good, okay. Great, just wanted to get that really quick. So a solid ops department has these five simple ingredients, excuse me. 
So the first one is process creation and annual planning. We really want to have a steady way to document what is going well and plan for upcoming um, you know, years and upcoming quarters. So what main goal there is establishing consistency. So really what we're taking a look at here is, okay, we do these things really well. We're going to process them out and make sure that we hit these milestones. And then we also are going to apply these milestones to, let's just say, forecasting out for the quarter. So really those are the core two kind of foundational elements. The key tools that you could be leveraging in, in this kind of ingredient one bucket are a company playbook. So a centralized location for all of your SOPs. Um, I've probably said this three or four times already, but I can't stress that enough as kind of the, the first step, the first to do. Um, I personally keep my playbook bookmarked on my browser and I have it open probably 80% of the time that I'm sitting at my desk, unless I'm doing something like this, um, where I'm actually giving a presentation or in a zoom meeting. But oftentimes when, when even I'm working with clients or when I'm working with my team, I've got it open and I'm able to kind of click out on one click from basically that document to anything in my business. Um, so the second tool that I'm recommending here is a process documenting process. <laughs> I know that sounds very meta, um, but but it's really, really important to know that when you identify something that needs to be written in the business, and it doesn't need to be you necessarily, it could be some key person on your administrative team, it could be even your number two, right? If you're working with somebody who's a partner or a COO who has some of these, um, you know, talents in, in kind of the ops stack, um, really can start to write these processes. But what happens is, and I see this so many times with a lot of the clients that we help, is they come to us and they have this big backlog of processes that need to be written and nobody to own it. And so imagine if that happened anywhere else in your business, right? There were a ton of customer service inquiries that came in and nobody answered them, right? It presents quite a problem. Um, so the third tool that I recommend here is an annual or quarterly planning um, template or something that you use every single quarter to basically assess what happened in the previous quarter, move forward with confidence, those types of things, make sure to plan out the next 90 days in terms of projects, really the basic things I would say um, that kind of go into annual planning. And then subsequently, a lot of folks do not track their annual goals, um, which it's kind of the set it and forget it type model. We want to make sure that we're tracking our annual and quarterly goals so that we know uh, what to expect when we go ahead and set you know, the next quarter worth of goals. So those are kind of those initial key ingredients for just, again, the baseline ops department. Really what the two kind of verticals are to help us there is getting things documented primarily and making sure that we're growing and hitting uh, you know, projections and goals and things. So the second key ingredient is efficiency monitoring. So once you've got things documented and you're like, all right, great, these are repeat processes that we're going to be doing over and over again, or we are hitting our goals, but might we be able to make things more efficient? So really going back through some of the things that we've uh, you know, established an ingredient one and really going through and saying, okay, how can we make this better? How can we do things faster or reach a goal quicker or with less hectic, right? I'm sure a lot of us have been on deadline for a project in the past or wanted to do something by the end of the quarter and then wake up two weeks before the end of the quarter and are like, ah, we have to go full speed ahead. That would be something that we could address in efficiency monitoring because in bucket one there, it all looks great because we got everything done on time. However, uh, we want to make sure that we are, you know, not burning out our team and not burning out ourselves. Again, creating more predictability and consistency and not having kind of that feature or famine model. So the main goal here is to work out the kinks nice and early, because especially as you're a smaller team, right, as you're kind of growing and in this phase of being malleable, being able to move things around really easily, you want to be able to really iron that stuff out before you've got, say, for example, tons of venture capital or partners or, you know, a bunch of team members, right? You want to get that kind of base level stuff worked out. So some solid ingredients for, or sorry, solid tools for ingredient number two include a company scorecard. And that's why I asked the question just earlier about key performance indicators and kind of what numbers you guys are looking at. Centralizing those numbers as well is really effective when taking a look at efficiency plays. Um, 
So potentially even tying a number or, you know, some sort of numerical value or something you can track from each of your processes um, would probably be the first and foremost preferred route, pulling them all together in a scorecard and saying, okay, great. If this process on how to onboard a new customer is really, really streamlined, it means that we're onboarding customers in 38 hours or less, right? So that's something that I think tying metrics to our processes in this efficiency, um, you know, kind of bucket is really, really helpful for being objective about how well our processes are performing and how well we're doing with some of our goals, uh, our annual and quarterly goals. So centralized project management tool is the second thing. Um, obviously, you can plan really great projects and, and you know, be really um effective without a project management tool, but as you start to become more, uh, you know, efficient and as you start to invite team members and things on, um, that's something that you're going to want to have is kind of a centralized uh, area where you can communicate around projects and kind of task out some of those projects. Um, the third tool is a centralized CRM. Um, CRM is a customer relationship manager. And basically how that works is it communicates with your customers. It communicates with folks who are thinking of becoming your customers. You can basically segment out lists of people that they, you want to communicate specific things to. So having that and a contact record of basically the history of a lead throughout your system or the history of a customer throughout your system, very, very useful, especially early on. One of the things that I'm glad I did and I got advice on early with my business is I have a very organized and very segmented customer relationship management platform, which means that I can communicate more personally to the group of people that I want to reach. Um, and so that's almost invaluable, especially as you're nurturing customers over a lifetime. So key pieces of tech. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because I think folks get too bogged down in tech, but that in my opinion would be something to pull in here. So around efficiency, if we're looking at um, chat tools for customer service, if we're looking at sales platforms for managing the sales cycle of a new client, those types of things we'd want to pull in here and make sure that they kind of fit the bill to support the processes that we've written in the first phase. And then training for all inbound team members, a very, very underrated um, method of uh, gaining efficiency. So I kind of hinted to this in the beginning where I mentioned that having ops and training really does kind of decrease the friction that it takes to basically train somebody up. If we can use our standard operating procedures to present somebody with a training path, they not only have a higher take rate in your business, meaning that they get up and running much faster, but there's also way less uh, you know, turnover in that case too, right? I, I can't even tell you how many times I personally have been through and my customers and clients have been through, um, you know, training and, and really investing a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with a new team member just for them to go away a few months later because they weren't really grasping the material. So getting out ahead of that and thinking through how we can make that better is going to be life-changing. So Solid ops department, third ingredient is quality and cost control. I know quality and efficiency sound very similar. However, they are very different. Um, efficiency is basically smoothing out some of those rough edges. Quality is kind of that 360 view of your customer, right? We really wanna take a look at quality and cost control being like these two um, you know, X and Y axis, right? Of your business and saying, okay, we can achieve the highest amount of quality for ideally the least amount of cost, right? And and so some things here, my main goal is to keep your customers happy, right? We want to make sure that we're pouring into them as much as humanly possible for what we've promised, but also being in a scenario where we know that we can monitor how much we're spending um, and not really hemorrhaging um, from anywhere. So this starts to get into the profitability conversation, um, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So key tools for ingredient number three. So a customer service team, this is um, super, super common, obviously in several different different types of markets. Um, but if you don't have a customer service team, because maybe you don't have a super high need for customer service, having a person on your team who is implementing a feedback loop. So that's the second ingredient for kind of this bucket of your ops is really taking a, a look at, okay, what have we provided to customers or what touch points have customers had with us in the past 
last 90 days and how did they potentially feel about those things, right? How did they feel about how we communicated with them? Did they understand what was coming next? What did they feel about the final deliverable? And how did they feel about moving forward, right? Did we easily present them with the next step? Just a couple of things you could be asking. Um, quality control process is another one uh, that's really, really underrated. Even just having a quick system of checks and balances before something ships and getting out ahead of that um, can really decrease a lot of the friction and quality um, and, and frankly cost, right? Especially if we're in a services industry, I can't tell you how many times where just checking something over for 10, 15 minutes before it's shipped actually saves a ton of rework because then what happens is it's an avalanche effect. The client sends it back and then they say, oh, by the way, I need these 80 other things. And then you're like, oh my goodness, all of a sudden my billable hour is like through the roof. And I basically am losing money on this project. So product or service scorecard is the next one. So any service or product that you're offering, um, I would like you to basically segment out your main company scorecard and, you know, kind of dive into your products and services specifically and say, okay, we're super profitable on product one, on service one, we're also really profitable, but on service two, there's a couple of points where we can potentially fix something. So looking at something from the business view is 100% viable. I definitely recommend doing that, but diving into specifics in each department of your business, as well as with each of your products and services is absolutely paramount so that you can make key decisions, right? To be able to, you know, either keep a service or keep a product on or potentially part with it. Um, team KPIs is also another one. So that can live in your central co uh, company scorecard. If you are in a situation where you want to um, keep cost efficient and quality, you know, on par and you're passing the baton as like, say the solopreneur, you know, for example, I know we've got a couple here. Um, you want to make sure that they can do, you know, some of the things that you are doing really well. And so keeping those KPIs out in front of your team, especially after you've trained them is going to be really, really, really important for that. So the fourth element is growth and scale squad. So that is your actual ops team. And so in my mind, that's something that after we've got a solid ops kind of structure, that's when we can start to really justify the cost of bringing on somebody either in house or that you've outsourced right with a contractor uh, relationship to come in and really help manage a lot of the things that you've already set up. And so this is a really exciting time because the main goal here is to be able to get more business and then handle it comfortably, right? Because we, I'm sure I've personally been in this situation. I know my clients have, and I'm sure y'all have too, is that you are excited to say yes to new business, but kind of secretly scared because you're like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to pull this off, or I don't have the team, or I don't have the resources. This in this case, right, is a solid management kind of team to be able to help with that. So really what the tools are that we're looking at here are the growth plan. So sitting down with kind of your key shareholders, you know, your ops team, all those people and creating a, a solid plan for growth so that you guys can adapt and kind of think through some of those contingency plans that might happen as you guys scale. Um, creating some cost projections um, and definitely do, um, I would say like a 30% growth, depending on your market, right? 30, 50, 80% growth. You know, if you're in a high growth market, do some of those projections and, and start to look at what your costs might look like as you guys get new business, because obviously that does change, um, you know, just based on, you know, past history with, uh, you know, clients and things. Um, and then leadership role development, guys, a super, super, super underrated actually uh, aspect of growing a solid business is leadership development, right? Putting the kind of baton in another person's hand and saying, hey, listen, this is what I need you to really lead, um, you know, the, the charge on, you know, with ops and, and with, you know, for example, sales and, and marketing and whatnot, right? Making these, uh, these key team members leaders, right, in the organization is huge. So, the fifth and final is profit management and improvement. Um, I'm super excited because there's probably nothing better than, um, you know, looking back at the year and being like, wow, we were wildly profitable. This is amazing, right? We've got a good business. We've got happy customers. We're super efficient. Nothing feels like it's on fire. And we've got money in our pocket at the end of the year, right? Which is so great. Um, so our main goal here is, you know, profit. <laughs> the tools for success here are operating budgets for two plus years, um, which is 
extremely underrated. I know that especially for, um, you know, funding and gaining funding and things into the future, right? If you're wanting to go through a gigantic growth year, you've got to absolutely have an operating budget that you can show potential investors. That's huge. And doing one for at least the year that you're in and then the following year is going to be huge for kind of maintaining and improving profit and making sure that you can take a look at where, you know, you can save some money. And then having the next one, a CFO or controller role, um, again, very underrated, or even having somebody come in at a fractional level, take a look at this operating budget and say, okay, these are my past financials, really, really have an honest conversation with them about where you're trending, where you feel like you're going to be looking in terms of your um, you know, pipeline for clients and new business and things like that. Very, very solid. And then improved profitability tracking and improved forecasting mechanisms. Those two things are, again, improved on what you've already got. So if you have a service and product kind of division, if you have a departmental division, if you have kind of a business view as well of your profitability, I would go ahead and just take a step deeper and take a look at potentially like how profitable is it for us to go down this potential marketing channel, right? So you, you can get into your marketing team, you can get into your sales team, you can get into your customer service team, right? For example, saying, okay, if we are X amount of responsive on customer service inquiries, then it's X more likely for us to keep this customer. And I'm getting very excited because I love the data and the clarity that comes from doing some of this work. And it really can help us, you know, discover what our next move is, right? We can say, okay, it's actually cheaper for us to make our marketing department or our sales department rather more um, efficient than it is for us to go and invest in any other paid advertising, for example, like that for us is very true. It's obviously in, you know, you universally true that keeping a customer is cheaper than going and getting another one. However, it becomes very clear how we can nurture that customer, right? And where we could potentially double down and say, okay, I can get new business this way. And then same thing with forecasting, right? If we have, you know, year over year forecasting mechanisms on 50, 80, you know, and 30% growth, potentially, depending again on your market, we can really be in a situation where we know in 16 months, just about what we're going to spend and just about what we're going to make, which is very comforting, right? It's very comforting. So those types of things are kind of the big five, at least that I have seen with my years of experience with ops, you know, I've worked in product businesses and in service businesses. So I definitely understand kind of the full scope. And there are a lot of things kind of under these hoods, but I wanted to make sure that again, we've got the basics set up for you guys so that you know what to do next. So if you do have stuff set up like this, the main goal then is maintenance, right? Really taking a look at improving things and keeping things maintained. Um, anything that you already have currently even in place, I would say if it's working for you well, ask yourself why and say, okay, could I implement this into other areas of my business and make sure that we keep up with this. So what key ingredient did you guys feel um, was something that you would like to implement in your business immediately? Go ahead and let me know in the chat. What did you guys feel like was like the next step for you guys, at least, you know, so far? Um, Clark, I saw your message. I believe that um, Haley is recording this and will be distributing the recording. Haley, am I correct? Thank you. I appreciate that. It's so good. It really is. Have oh, been doing I'm this glad. for 20 years and this is excellent. For all you guys out there, she's right on the money. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Clark. Um, Molly, yes. Uh, thank you for the time that you did spend with us. I'm hoping that we can get the recording out. Great. Um, Star, you mentioned growth and scale squad. That's awesome. So it looks like you need somebody to come in and help you kind of manage some ops. Tammy, a solid CRM product setting up SOPs. Okay. Good client shareable project management tool. All right. Mandy agrees with Tammy, manage the scaling for Darius. Okay. That's awesome guys. So we're kind of in a situation where we're kind of straddling both ends of the spectrum here, which is awesome because I think we've got everyone kind of plotted in different points in these five areas. Um, I personally feel like, again, it's a, thanks Steve, thanks for being with us. 
Um, but yeah, I, I personally feel like this is an ongoing thing. And I think I have this later in the presentation, but I'll tease you guys. It's like one of the biggest things that I see, like the biggest struggle with ops departments and like getting some of this stuff up and running is creating the accountability within the business, right? Either from the owner's perspective to be able to kind of do this ongoing or inside of the team, right? If you task somebody with managing some of this stuff, or if you task somebody with, um, you know, being the key leader in your ops department, it becomes really difficult right? To kind of keep this and, and accountability and momentum going. And that is number one, the biggest thing. Um, so you're not alone and keep at this because like I said before, in the very, very beginning, this has serious, serious, uh, you know, implications on the health of your business into, you know, eternity. So I'm going to keep going, but thank you guys so much for your participation in the chat. Oh, one more question. <laughs> so what's been your biggest takeaway so far too? So we talked key ingredients. I want to talk takeaways. Um, Darlene says, yes, this is a challenge. Amy says it's our biggest issue. Okay. So yeah, accountability, big, big thing. Um, but what's been your biggest takeaway so far? And it doesn't need to be one of the five ingredients. You guys can just say like, what do you plan to kind of take action with or that you've written down right away? Onboarding and training quality. Thanks, Clark. That's wildly underrated. I think it's something crazy, like 30% of the person's salary that you're hiring in is like what it costs to train them um, if we're doing kind of the one-on-one -on -one approach. So as you know, you guys can see, that's it gets very expensive <laughs> to train a person if we don't have something in place. Okay. So let's keep on going. So we're going to talk about how to affect change. Again, this is the biggest thing I've seen um, kind of be that friction point in businesses where we say, all right, yeah, this all sounds great, but then what? <laughs> like, what do I do? How do I make sure that this kind of lasts in my business? And one of the things I can encourage you guys here today with is ops is such an overlooked piece of the business. And frankly, again, an unsexy piece of the business, but it likely lives among your core values, right? It likely lives with some of those really key things that you're talking about with your team, like trust and accountability, right? We want to be thinking systems minded because we want to be thinking about efficiency and we want to be thinking about quality and we want to be thinking about repeat, right? Because this is your special thing, right? You've learned how to get amazing results in your market and people come to you instead of going to other businesses. So that that's extremely special. And we need to make sure that that's documented. We need to make sure that your team understands that they are pioneers of this brand, right? That they are actually behind this big thing that you're doing. So I'm going to talk about affecting change here in part four. So what's been holding you guys back um, other than the accountability piece that I talked about um, basically from implementing this in the past? I know that's a hard question. So don't, you don't have to feel like you need to get too personal. Amy says, I need to carve out time for many of the items. Okay. Usually busy working in and not on the business. Amy, that's a really powerful um, thing to say. And you're definitely not alone. Um, there are so many people who get bogged down, you know, with the urgent and kind of forget about the essential things. Um, so you're definitely not alone. Tammy says the need for documenting processes. That's awesome. That's definitely the foundational step. So, and, and I'll uh, share with some of you, uh, share with you guys some hacks a little bit later. So what's the biggest thing holding you guys back right now? Focus and client demands working in the business. Okay. Holding people accountable to tasks is super hard because volunteers. Yeah, I, I totally get that, Amy. Totally, totally get that. We'll circle back on that um, at the end here with, with kind of the workshop time. Time and priority, Darlene says. Yeah, I totally understand, guys. Okay, so this seems, like I said, it seems essential, not urgent. And oftentimes, right, we get presented with things and it just needs, the fire needs to be put out, right? So often it happens that folks just don't focus on this. And so the number one struggle, like I said, I see is accountability and here's why. So step one, let's go through a quick little story. The leader us on the call here gets a new strategy, right? We're at a workshop, we're at a live event, you know, or a, a virtual event. Um, and we get a new strategy with sales or with marketing or with customer service or with lovely ops. And we get super excited about it, right? We're like, I'm going to run back and I'm going to implement this into my business tomorrow or today or right this very second. And so the leader communicates with the team. They come back and they're like, oh yeah, found this amazing thing. I was totally transformed by this speaker. And this is how we're going to do it moving forward. 
the team feels super overloaded. They're like, wait a second, you had one of these two months ago and it was going to be the brand new thing and it didn't really work. And also we have like 600 other things on our plate. So they're just like, holy cow. And even you yourself, right? So if you're a solopreneur, you're in the situation where you're like, I love this idea, but I literally can't fit anything else on my plate. And so you start to feel overwhelmed. And the team can't keep up with the workload. And so that's what happens. Or you can't keep up with the workload as a solopreneur. So step five is inevitably things fall through the cracks, right? Things either get pushed off the plate that you currently have, or there's not enough room on the plate to push everything you know, else aside. And so nothing gets implemented, nothing's consistent. And it actually is very frustrating. Behind the scenes, basically, here's what's happening. So I'm going to help you guys kind of understand a couple shifts that we can make when we hear new ideas and we want to implement new things. So if we think of our business like this, right, we ha- we've got the baseline here, the foundation is ops, we've got our tactics, right, our specific tactics, and then we've got our strategy, right? And so these things exist one with one another in a couple of ways. When you come back from this great idea, right? When you hear all these really fun things, you come back and you kind of force the strategy, right? You say, hey, Ali says that we need to have five key components to our ops. And here's the big main reason why. Right now, what I'm giving you guys is a mix of strategy and tactics, right? I'm not coming in and writing processes for you. So what you do is you give the strategy to the team and then expect them to figure out the tactics and the ops, right? And how we basically, it trickles down into the organization. Now, in Instead, what we want to do is we want to take to the team, hey, here's incrementally operationally how we're going to change this, right? It looks like this process is different or this project management tool is the new one that we're going to use. And here's exactly how we're going to roll out this new project or really being clear with exactly the next step of what exactly we're going to be going through. And so this quick shift helps affect change in organizations so, so, so much easier because they're following new protocols, they're hitting new KPIs, they are exactly clear on what's going on. Instead, if we come to them with this big high in the sky, these are all the change, you know, the changelings that we're going to affect this year, it's going to be a, a much lower take rate. I always say leave the strategies to the strategists and the implementation to the implementers. And that is wholeheartedly true when coming in and rolling out anything new to your team, right? You want to be in a situation where you can say, okay, I understand this with whoever is providing my strategy with me. And I know that this is the right move for my business because of X, Y, and Z. I've looked at X data. I've looked at X, you know, market product or market performance in the past or whatever. And this is the way for sure I'm going to go. And the team, in, in, in a, hopefully not to sound too rude, but they don't need to know all of that stuff, right? They don't need to know like the big strategy behind everything, unless we're in like a quarterly planning or an annual planning capacity. What they need to know is how is my day to day going to change? And so that is probably the best way that we can establish buy-in because they can wrap their mind around, okay, this to me in my day to day is going to be the next thing that I need to do, right? This is what I'm doing tomorrow to help implement this. So that can be just as simple as, for example, like recording their screen when they're doing key processes for you guys. That's a solid hack to be able to start down that road of processizing out the business, right? It's easier than ever to record your screen. I personally have one in my Chrome extension and it's called Loom, L-O-O-M.com. And basically what I do is I write out my to-do list every single day and I basically color code what I'm going to do, delegate and document. And so those three things are huge for your to-do list because what you can do is every time you go to tick something off your to-do list, you can say, oh, cool, I have to document this thing. I'm going to record my screen and then put it in a library of, you know, documentation videos so that in the future, instead of it being labeled, you know, document, it could be labeled delegate and I can send it over to my team. So super, super easy, um, quick little hack to do. Um, And so this is basically how to address your operational change. You can change and update procedures. Like I mentioned, you can update key performance indicators. Like I mentioned, improve reporting. That's another big thing. So if you can come in and say, Hey, listen, we are, you know, migrating project management tools, or we're using this loom, um, you know, video to, or this loom platform to record videos for our processes. 
And we expect that each of you creates uh, four videos a week or something like that, right? Something nice and incremental, um, small changes, and then improving tracking and measuring, which is again, something like I just mentioned, you know, something around screencast, something very, very simple that they can kind of take in a bite-sized chunk and say, all right, great. I can totally implement this. Now what's next, right? Once they kind of build that habit, then we can add another thing on. Um, because I know I personally feel very overwhelmed when someone comes to me and they're like, oh, you have to do these eight new things every single day this week. And I'm like, okay, I, I just want to do one of those things. So how are we digesting everybody? I know that was a little bit more of a heady um, section. <laughs> Okay. Feeling a little overwhelmed. Angela said struggle is real. Okay. Are you guys, um, just talk to me about how we feel overwhelmed. I hope is, uh, going to be alleviated here in a little bit. I'm going to open up for questions and things. We've got like 15 minutes left. Oh, good. Do delegate and document is a very helpful thing. That's awesome. Thanks, Mandy. That's personally what I've leaned on um, pretty much ever since I've been in business. And I started as a solopreneur as well, um, doing some one-on-one -on -one stuff. Star says feeling motivated. That's so exciting. Thanks, Star. Oh, overwhelm in response to my last question. Sorry, Angela. <laughs> Um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just, I think the next one is for working time. Yeah. So what I want you guys to do is go over to operationsagency.com slash NEC. I got, um, some templates together that I felt like would be useful for you guys. And I want to kind of go through them really fast. I'm going to pull up that on my screen too. And then what we can do is I'll talk through each of these and we can do some working time and then open up for some questions, unless you guys want to do some working time first. And, um, do questions or sorry, do questions first and then working time second. So happy to do either. So I'm going to just quickly go over what I gave you guys here and then we can move forward, but the playbook template. So that is basically the central location for all of your standard operating procedures. That's something that you guys can use like immediately. And let me just really quickly riff about SOPs. I can get down a rabbit hole kind of quickly with this. Um, so it's the link, Amy is operationsagency.com slash NEC. Um, I'll write it in the chat too. Oh, thank you, Haley. So again, central location. And I want to really quickly go over something about SOPs because we've got the process template as well um, here linked in the um linked in the resources section. So the playbook is a really, really efficient tool to basically house three things. So the first is your standard operating procedures. So that's what you would use the process template for. That's a step-by-step -step procedure for doing something in your business. The second thing that it can house is those videos I was talking about, right? So if you don't have somebody on your team who's able to take, say, for example, a video and write out a step-by-step -step procedure, you can link those videos inside of the playbook so that you can say, hey, listen, I need to send out, you know, an email to all of our current customers updating them on X, Y, and Z, or, you know, I'm going to delegate that to somebody on my team. Here's a video on how I did that, right? And then once they get comfortable with doing it, potentially they could, you know, create your procedure. So, so procedures first, second is videos, and third is any assets that you have in the business already. So example is if you already have a place like a scorecard, for example, or an operating budget or a training that you've already created or any marketing materials that you've made or lead magnets or whatever, right? You can put all of that stuff into the playbook so that it can basically just be one click away in your business. So I'm going to open this up really fast so that you guys can kind of see how this goes. And I put a 90 day kind of plan on the front end of this for you guys, because I personally know that I feel a little bit better when I've been able to kind of like strategically take a look at, um, everything and what I want to go through. And so looking at what your vision is and how this might, you know, kind of come about in the next 90 days and what these top three outcomes might be is, is probably a solid thing for y'all to go through if you haven't done this work already. Um, so this is pretty great. And then these are the kind of standard buckets, at least uh, that I see uh, usual businesses needing to kind of start out uh, some of these things. So those assets I was talking about likely live in marketing, um, that kind of thing. I'm going to quickly just keep going here. So process template is basically the template that I use to write out procedures. You guys can get yourselves familiar with that. And I've also linked inside of the administrative section of the playbook template, a process documenting best practices. So you can go ahead and um, you know go through that and read through that. 
Um, the training playbook, this is basically for any new hires. I've broken this out into basically a weekly um, example for you if you guys want to take a look in um, basically an ops department. So <laughs> that's a fun little Easter egg you guys can hang out and, and take a look at. And then an operating budget template. Um, so these are like the standard um, ops expenses or business expenses, excuse me. And I basically have um, listed out the three situations that I recommend you guys take a look at. So 50, 80, and 30% growth um, there on the other side. So um, Tammy asked what extension I'm using to start the timer. I'll just write this here in the doc for you guys. It's loom.com. And it's a screencasting tool. And I don't know, I'm sure you guys can see my whole desktop, right? We can yeah. see it. So right here, it just pops up like super, super easy. And then you can see my little face, hi. Um, and then just go ahead and record your screen and tell them what you're doing and, and what results you're getting. And it's super, super simple. And then it'll automatically save it to your account. And then you can basically um, just rock and roll and delegate pretty much anything you want from there. Okay, so what I'm thinking is maybe we'll do questions first and then um, any questions you guys have about the tools, anything you guys are going through specifically and what you might lean on. And then we could potentially either break or I can hang out for a few more minutes and we can take a look at maybe the playbook. Awesome. I would love for people to just unmute themselves if they're willing. Yeah, please jump in. I promise I will not bite and I am very excited to be um, helpful to you guys. Oh, thanks, Mandy. Anyone going through anything specifically? I know that this is a lot. Um, so in terms of like next steps and things, I would say taking some time and spending some time with the playbook template and really just thinking through like, okay, how could I organize um, a little bit more of, you know, what I'm doing in my business day to day. So again, I think the really helpful, um, exercise again, that I do literally every day as I write out my to-do list and I personally manage my to-dos in a platform called Trello. Um, and I can even show you, uh, my to-do list if that's helpful. I and really one... want to see your to-do list, honestly. <laughs> Please don't judge me. There are a lot of things, but I'll show you guys, um, I'll show you guys basically what um, what I do to manage this. So you guys can see my screen? Yep. Yeah, okay. So Sandbox, super, super helpful. I actually have a little quick um, shortcut from my phone onto this Sandbox so I can just make a card and basically come in and like have all my ideas have a place. Then my team and I, or I sit down and I say, what is going to be moved from my sandbox into my to do's for today. And then I pull all this out and then I link like the document and do for me, I don't want to update images on my sales pages anymore. So I decided that I'm going to do this today, but I would like to get it documented as well. So I'm going to record my screen while I do this delegate is something that I send over to my team delegate. Also something I send over to my team. Um, so pretty solid. And I also put personal to do's just in my regular to do list, but you guys don't have to do that. <laughs> I just like seeing my full scope. <laughs> yeah, this is a killer to do list. I also love Trello. A new tool I just learned about is called notion as well. Yes, Notion's fantastic. And I'm actually implementing that with one of our clients right now. And we're using it as basically like their entire ops hub. It's really searchable. Um, so that's something that is basically the banner, um, just like the banner criteria for me for a solid playbook or a solid place to kind of keep project stuff is to be so searchable. Because for me, a lot of us create um, Google Docs and things like that, right? And then how many of you have been like, where was that thing I made that one time? And you're like, oh, I can't find this anywhere. And so it's super unsearchable, in my opinion, natively Google Drive. So keeping everything kind of in the front, that's how like kind of the playbook was born. Um, so yeah. How are we feeling? Sometimes yeah, what questions? I, I mean, yeah, what people, questions do you guys have? <laughs> I think people have, have asked their questions during the workshop too. And mm -hmm. okay, Star has a question. Some we strategies should. to effectively discuss team goals and accountabilities. Oh yeah. Okay. So I am, how do I put this? I wouldn't say a tough manager, but I'm definitely a um 
I guess a tough manager is probably the right word. Um, so I actually put all of the goals and accountabilities kind of forefront with my team. I also share profitability with my team, which I know is a very uncommon practice, but one of our core values is everyone has a hand in being profitable. And I tie specific numbers to outcomes in the business specifically relating to profitability, because that's my number one thing that I want to do is I want to be profitable. Number one, because if I'm not profitable, I'm not going to be in business. And number two, I want to provide great results for our clients. So that's the top two things that we always need to be looking at. What I do star is I create my scorecard. And so I can share, probably I'll dump the scorecard um, template that I have link as well into this, um, into this, uh, Google doc that I gave you guys. But basically what I do is I come in and I say, okay, this is our quarterly plan. Here are the key performance indicators to show us that our quarterly plan is working well, or that we're working toward what we want. And every person on the team at least has one KPI in that quarterly goal. So what they need to do is they need to open up my scorecard and they need to log their key performance indicator. This helps for two reasons. First is it builds that repetition, right? I need to be really, really, really focused on this goal, right? It's very important every single week I'm revisiting this, looking at this, holding myself accountable, right? The second thing is if I ever need to have tough conversations with the team, they're almost like primed when they come to the meeting with me because they're like, I know that I filled out a key performance indicator that was under what my performa should be, right? So they come to me with solutions already saying, Hey, Ali, here's the deal. Like, I know that this was like this last week. Here's why it kind of got funky and here's my plan. So they're like writing me a personal improvement plan already before they get on a call with me. So that is really, really helpful for me because I have to have less difficult conversations with my team and my team really does own a lot of the results, uh, you know, that we get for our clients. Started that answer your question. Okay, good. I'm so glad. And what then, else? What I else? Maybe I saw Mandy. Did you have a question, Mandy? I can just start my video. Hi, I was like, <laughs> hi, Mandy. Curiously typing it out because I'm blending a couple questions in one. Um, but the question is really about like resources as a small startup. We had an ops person, a dedicated ops person. It didn't work out. Um, we have gone the VA route, but that that relationship only almost takes as much time for me to manage as it does me doing the work itself, right? Mm -hmm. to, to try to hand that off. So I think where we are now is we don't have an, you know, it, I'm just doing it. Um, so I think my question is, is it a terrible idea in your experience to have blended roles where, uh, you know, I'm putting ops onto someone who's already doing some other duties um, until we can really justify the headcount for a full-time ops person. Yeah. You know, Mandy, thank you for this question, because actually I was in a meeting with a client earlier today and we were talking about this specific thing. Um, in their case, they uh, have a lot of project management needs and they just can't justify the cost for a full-time project manager right now. And the short answer to your question is yes, you can definitely have someone, especially in a small business, straddling multiple roles. My advice, however, is that usually what happens is, is if you have an ops need or you have a project management need or you have any real need, right, for any role in your business, what we tend to do is we tend to try to take the standard, right? Take the standard customer service representative and like make our business fit that job description. And that's not what we need to be doing, right? If we have a very small customer service need or a very small operational need, defining what that is, what the processes are and what the key performance indicators are, are really kind of the first step. And then the second step is saying, okay, this takes about X amount of time. So someone could likely straddle this role and this role if it's 20 hours and 20 hours, let's just say, right? To be clear. And then here is what will present itself to us when we need to hire a full-time person, right? So let's just say the hourly count becomes X, Y, or Z, or they're writing more than 50 processes a week, or they're, you know what I mean? Doing that sort of thing. So I would say anything like that, just making sure to define the parameters first, because then what ends up happening is then you have people with like eight titles. Instead, you could just like make up a fun title and say, here are your KPIs, right? Like it seems much less stressful to me, right? And instead of saying like, you're the project manager, ops manager, and customer service representative, it's just very um, overwhelming. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Lauren, for your time. We'll see you later. Um, anyone else have a question? 
Alex, yeah. you want to mute yourself? Yeah, I'll hop on. Hi, um, how's it going? I'm Alex. I'm uh, one of the interns working for Zap at the EC. Um, just listening in. Great, great presentation. Really informative. Thank you. Um, so what I was wondering was, uh, when you look at the needs of small business, so you mentioned that like sometimes operations gets put kind of on the back burner from a hiring perspective because there are more important roles for the business at times that need to be filled first. So my question would be, what would your advice be for those sort of entrepreneurs that are just starting out looking to hire people um, for like, whether it's qualities, characteristics, past backgrounds, what should you be looking for in non-operations roles for employees that might like, you know, characteristics that will make them prone to be a good fit within like trying to establish operations, if that makes sense. So you're thinking, sorry, I think I'm confused a little bit. Let me just ask a clarifying question. So you're asking yeah. about the first ops hire or the hire, what they should be looking for in other departmental hires, like in marketing yes. or in sales? Second one. So like non-operations hires, what do you look for to, that says, okay, they'll work well within my establishing of norms and ops for this team? Yeah. So I think that, I mean, obviously each department has its own needs in terms of staffing. Right. And I think that, um, you know, soft skills and tangible skills are, um, you know, a, kind of a difficult, uh, thing to navigate regarding uh, new hires. And I think it's also very difficult to gauge very properly in the vetting process. Um, you know, what is, like what their core values are, <laughs> right? So uh, for me, I would say um, clearly, clearly, clearly just communicating your vision to them 100%. That's gotta be the number one thing. Um, and saying, hey, listen, this is what I expect. And then here are the numbers that I actually expect alongside that. Um, the second thing I think looking for is obviously a background in, you know, something that I'm hiring them to do. Right. So something like that. And then I personally don't spend a lot of time vetting somebody. I give a fair amount of people like a two week trial in my business because my systems are set up so well. And my training processes are set up so well that I know within the first couple of days, whether or not someone's going to be successful with me. And that means that they're putting up X numbers or they're grasping material at X rate or whatever. Right. So I think that setting up some of the training path, um, I know that a lot of entrepreneurs say hire slow, fire fast. I say hire fast, fire fast, right? Let people get in and get their hands dirty and show you the work that they can do. And then if it's not working out in like a week or two, have that be a trial run, keep your other folks kind of on, um, communication loop and then get the other people. in if you feel like they're not performing very well. Awesome. I have to hop off, but thank you very much for the presentation and for answering my question. Have a great yeah, day. Yeah, of course, Alexander. Thanks, Alex. What Any other, other questions, questions do we have? That might be it. Okay. I wanted to just mention two more things really, really quickly. Um, so if you guys have questions, concerns, uh, comments, anything like that. I'm actually super available. Um, I, I love collaborating like this in, in lots of different settings. So um, I am available. You guys can hop over to my website, operationsagency.com. There's a resources section where I have mix of free and paid things that you guys can leverage in your business operationally. Um, the second thing is, is if you guys want to dive deep on like a specific issue that you're having with your business, something that maybe you didn't feel comfortable sharing today, or maybe you start to have some thoughts about how some of this could apply to you and you have some specific questions, you guys can book a call with me. You can either find it on that resources page or you can just head to operationsagency.com slash call um, and just book in with me. And that's a direct link to my calendar. We'll be talking for 30 minutes and we can kind of discuss some things, you know, specifically that you're going through. So again, I'd like to make myself available to you guys. I know that this stuff isn't easy and I know that I'm not here, you know, uh, promising your next 10 clients or like this exciting sales and marketing promise. Um, but this really does have a gigantic impact on, you know, just your business's future. So I'm really thankful for your time. Um, and just thankful for your participation as well. You guys were super easy to collaborate with. Thank you so much, Allison. <laughs> Thanks everyone. I hope you enjoy your day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks Allison. Thanks, Appreciate it. Thanks Clark. <laughs> See you guys.